Alrighty, so recently I did a video about 10 cards I thought we should be playing more of. Uh, I guess today is going to take a little bit more of a negative view on things. It's going to be 10 cards I think we should play less. Um, now, when I pick these cards, I intentionally picked cards that I think are actually good, but probably overplayed at the same time. Cards that are in decks that are winning or in decks that are competing at events, right? I didn't put cards that aren't in a lot of decks or cards that aren't succeeding very much here. Um, the idea here is to generate some conversation about these cards, maybe cards that uh, we're kind of taking for granted as just auto includes in decks. And uh, we just slot them in because that's what we do and that's what we've done. Uh, we're not thinking very clearly about alternatives because we've gotten so used to playing them already. Um, so, yeah, so some of these cards certainly I expect a lot of people will think are very good or no, the way that they're not, that they should be played less, like these are staples. Um, some of them might not reach that level of um, discourse, but uh, yeah, I in order to make this as interesting as possible and to generate as much strategy conversation about these things, I thought the cards themselves needed to be worth talking about. Uh, before we get going, uh, if you haven't subbed yet to the channel, please do. It helps out a lot. And also, please check out my Patreon if you haven't already. Uh, I think there's a lot of cool stuff there. I put a, a lot of deck lists, uh, my testing lists, and also uh, there's a testing gauntlet and more things to come there. So link will be in the description. All right, let's go. Number 10. So number 10 is probably more fringy than most of the other ones I put here. It's Traitorous. I still see this card pop up quite a bit. It's usually not in like giant numbers, but it's like either splattered as like a one or two of, sometimes in the sideboard. I'm just not really sure what we're trying to get out of this card right now. Like maybe there was like a week where Tarkin Yellow was played a lot and they were like going phantoms into tie advanced and like traitorous was pretty clean into that there aren't many other answers sometimes for a tie phantom but overall i think even though it is kind of a built-in two for one right you like steal it you steal a unit which means you're killing one of their units and gaining one the card is a two for one the fact that it has to take something small uh is generally just not impactful enough at five resources um this card is really really bad against Sabine not just because like by the time you're gonna play it um, they've probably hit you for 25 damage already or whatever it is but also because Poe exists and they're just gonna blow you out you will instantly lose the game if you play a traders and then they energy conversion lab a Poe so I don't think you can justify this card because of Sabine um, into like the Han blue decks like the only decent target they have is a Yoda, uh, which is nice, right? Like you trade her a Yoda, you kind of like also get the card draw if you manage to pull that off. But they also play Pose in the main deck. So like they have incidental upgrade hate um, against like control decks. You basically have nothing relevant to steal unless it's a super laser tech, but that's hard to pull off. Like, I mean, it's doable if you like resupply and then trade her and play nothing to the board. Um, there are ways to get like that super laser tech steal done, but a savvy opponent who ha who's playing either like Palpatine or Kira will actually just like self-sacrifice the super laser tech before you can trade or risk it. In general, I'm giving you a lot of reasons where I just like don't see what edges this card ends up giving you. Um, I think most decks that are playing this would be better served just playing something else. All right, number nine. You know, I, I put this up and I, I played this card right I had two of this card in my Gen Con Kira deck uh, it's the client um, but you know while I think the card is good I think it may also be overplayed um, I am considering right now making a swap from this into some other cards I think the client is best like at its best against mid-range decks actually not so much against aggro decks uh, I think client helps close out games that are a little slower, right? So that you can get to the point in the game where like the only outs these decks have are burst damage from like a unit. And if you have a client in play, they can basically never play a unit into the board because you will just, all their units end up healing you, right? Client 
it's actually pretty good into like Boba Fett because of this, right? Um, Boba Fett's not as fast at killing a control deck as Sabine. And you're often able to get to a point where like the only danger is like fire spray hitting you twice, right? But like client will mitigate a lot of that late in the game, especially from a deck that's only going to be able to play like a little bit to the board at a time. Um, often the client's a little too slow into Sabine. Now it can also be decent there late in the game, but I can see certainly that there are alternatives to this card. Uh, I don't think it should be just an auto slam in control decks. Um, so because of that, I wanted to include it here and also talk about like, hey, like this is a card that I've run that I've very much played, but I had to take a step back a little bit and be like, well, is this something that is actually helping me win in the matchups that I'm having more difficulty with? Or is it just helping me close out games against decks that this deck is already good against, right? So like in the Kira scenario here, like, yes, this card I think is very good into Boba. I think the deck is already very good into Boba though. So let's maybe trim there and find something that can help us in some more difficult matchups. All right, number eight is Carabast. Uh, this card is basically only being played in like a young Han deck right now. Um, it's fine. I think it does its job sometimes. It's just more awkward to set up than it first seems. Uh, I like that it can kill like a turn one play out of Sabine. If you like wound one of your own units, you can do three. So right, most of their turn one plays would be either like A-Wings, Battlefield Marines. What Sabine's like whatever whatever it is, it can generally kill their turn one play. Um, but it usually eats up your whole turn two, unless you kept a very low to the ground hand that had like multiple two drops where you can like play one of them as a one cost. Um the idea is also that this has some like synergies late in the game, especially with something like redemption, because redemption can auto damage itself, and then you can spend two to basically kill anything. Now I am just a little lower on damage-based removal in general right now. I think a lot of issues uh, decks have are actually with shielded units, uh, whether they're from Boba, uh, even like Kylo can like out aggro people with shielded units. Kira keeps shielding units. Um, Phantoms, right, are immune to this kind of removal in general. Uh, it's just not always great like i i think it's certainly serviceable i think it can be part of the removal package in that han blue deck or in a mono red han deck or han green like whatever young han basically it's only in a young han deck because of the self damage ability but um i think it doesn't need to be like an automatic three of or like an automatic two of in these decks i think you need to look at your removal package as a whole um look at open fires uh look at fell of the dragons look at takedowns potentially uh look at make an opening look at vanquish rivals fall like there, there's a billion of them i think some of those are also overplayed we'll talk about them in a little bit but in general um i think carabast maybe revisit and be like well is this really like golden is this really what we want in every game like do we want to draw carabast every game is that really what's winning us are these games and maybe reevaluate the the entire removal pool in the deck itself uh, number seven is Concord Dawn Interceptors. Um, I think they're fine. Uh, I, I don't think this card's actually amazing. I, th I think in Ray, for instance, it, it definitely gets a little boost, right? Being able to uh, buff it up. The card just does absolutely nothing on offense, right? It's usually not even worth the action to attack with this thing. Uh, because of that, you're, you're essentially just playing a wall, right? And hoping that it uh, messes with your opponent. And often it does for a little bit, but by the time they're ready to get through it they're usually going to do it profitably because it's just sitting there it's not doing anything other than just sitting there and delaying uh i think there's very clean ways for it to go poorly for you with like you play they played an a wing like the sabine and then they play a red three right like that a wing you can just like kill trade with this concord dawn that's a trade down for you in general um it's okay i think as far as like including it it's certainly something that can be included in in a lot of blue hero decks as sort of like a stall package um but i don't think it should be taken 
as an automatic card that you just like jam this in. I still see it a lot in like a lot of decks in general uh, in numbers that sometimes I would be like, well, is it is it really that necessary? Um, I don't I don't maybe this one's a little bit of a stretch. Like, I don't think this is getting played like so much that it's like completely <laughs> deserving of this list. But I did want to talk about this card because um, just to kind of like get the point across that this is very particular. It is not doing anything other than damage prevention. And if and it gives your opponent a ton of leeway in in like how to deal with it because it's not attacking, right? Like you, you can never attack with this. It, it makes no sense usually to spend an action to deal one to something or one to your opponent's base. So you're just hoping that your opponent doesn't draw into something that can deal with this and you're just like really like all your eggs are in that basket like this is holding space for x amount of time except you don't know when that time might be up all right number six another removal this is takedown now this was pretty staple card in set one uh i just don't think it needs to be a staple anymore um at four cost the, the game is moving very fast and it's very resource intensive and you need to be winning your trades a lot, either by sheer two for oneing opponents or making your resource trades better. Uh, takedown in a lot of situations is a trade down against most of the units that this is like good against. It's actually costing more than the unit costed, right? Like the, all the three fives that get played, the, uh, space units that like like Seventh Fleet or. A wings or like what things that are more difficult to kill sometimes for decks that are playing blue removal um so in general it, it is a trade down uh now it can one shot a few leaders but generally those leaders it doesn't set up right like sabine kylo right i don't know when the last time i've ever been able to take down one of those the turn they flipped if it's going to happen it's going to happen the turn after but that's not even great so it's uh it's not a very efficient card. It's one of those like oh I have to include it because it's like a necessary evil. I just need outs to this kind of stuff. Except I'm not sure this even needs to be included in all decks anymore that even removal based decks like control decks. Um I think we have kind of a big enough pool potentially to just play other cards. Um additionally I think uh, relying on one-for-one -one trades in general right now is not great. Like you want your removal, your one-for-one -one removal to be very efficient because it's generally uh, not great card advantage. Like things like Fell the Dragon, for instance, is very efficient because it's going to blow up something that can cost like nine. Now that, that'll still be usually two for one in you, right? You Fell the Dragon and Avenger, you got two for one. The Avenger killed one of your units but it was such an efficient resource trade that you might you can get ahead on that transaction same with like power of the dark side right uh it's such a resource light commitment it can destroy things that are so much more expensive than it that even if those things got card advantage on you that resource advantage might offset that but takedown virtually never offsets that resource advantage and often will also be a card disadvantage or a damage disadvantage, right? If you're, if you're forced to take down like a K2, that could be card disadvantage if they make you discard, or it can be damage disadvantage because maybe they've hit you for four already and then they're going to hit you for another three with that K2's ability. So in a lot of cases, takedown is just not like it's, not, you're not ever happy playing it unless you know, they buff something to five health and then you kill it immediately, right? And they like lose the buff and the unit. That's like where it's at its best. But overall, I think this card can start getting trimmed for sure from some lists. All right, number five, Bodhi Rook. Um, all right, this is a double yellow card. So naturally we're talking about double yellow decks. So that's Boba, that's Han. It's basically nothing else. Um, Bodhi. What is he good against? Typically, you would say he's good against control decks. Uh, he's snagging non-units. Those are the decks that play the most non-units. He's not statted well enough to be good into like aggressive decks anyway. So he's not there to like bash. He's there to like interact. Um, it's just the problem with him is that he's not actually that good into like the blue-green control decks. 
Uh, not only because he can miss so much, because they, they're still like 35 unit decks a lot of the time, but also because he dies to everything they play. So his card advantage uh, isn't even that efficient because he's not worth a card himself in that matchup. Talk about him getting ambushed by something like a Lone Pike or a Gideon. Talk about him coming down and then being a free kill for Kira herself. And then she, bam, bashes him, becomes a seven attack unit. Um, he's The fact that he can miss so frequently and also even when he hits... He potentially still, like that card advantage still offsets because like the unit itself isn't very great. Uh, I think knocks him down a peg. Like that's supposed to be the best matchup for him and he's still not awesome there. It's obviously not very good into like Sabine. I think it, uh, Mono Yellow Boba needs to really be the acro deck in that matchup to fully succeed. It is a favored matchup for Boba Yellow. Slightly, I think, not by much. Like, And that's anecdotal. Like I can't promise you it's a favored matchup, but I, I think... Most of the time that the Boba is going to win, it's not because it's playing Bodhi Rook. It's because it's like playing a seventh fleet defender and then cunning and then like pushing damage, right? And Bodhi Rook can miss a ton against Sabine. He can hit Dark Sabers and four cause I believe in, but nothing else particularly matters. And even the four cause uh, is often getting resourced by Sabine. Um, into like Han... Young Han decks, I think, again, like the unit itself uh, isn't interacting too well with them. And they're also like pretty event-like decks. They usually only have 8 to 10. So like, again, it's just the risk of him missing plus the fact that even when he hits, it sometimes still isn't worth it because the unit isn't great. I, I think makes this potentially like not need to be, I think, well, first of all, he's already getting trimmed sometimes for Boba Yellow. So maybe I'm a little too late to this party, but um. I think yeah, I think I think it's ver it's uh it's pretty safe to start trimming this card. It might be more of a sideboard card. Uh, it might not even need to be there. Um, but in general, uh, maybe overplayed. Uh, I talked a lot about Boba there. Uh, it might also apply to the Han Yellow. I think that deck is so much more focused though on hand attack with Spark of Rebellion, Bodhi, and potentially the Kira unit that uh it might just be too important to that like sequence and like him being able to protect the DJ tech combo from interaction is also pretty important. So in that, in that version, I think Bodhi probably is too necessary, but certainly in the Boba decks, uh, that play rate can come down. <laughs> Number four, Boba. Okay. Boba unit, right? Um, so this recently with the onset of set two, there was a rule change, right? That, um, said leaders now were coming into play when you deployed them as opposed to like having already been in play all game uh boba used to be very good on leader deploy turns because they were considered in play already so if they deployed and attacked with their leader boba could do six to it right this was a bane for sabine this was really bad for han uh old han as well um it's just that with that change the effect on this card has become incredibly situational um so much that i like barely ever even see it go off now this unit is still a three five and the floor is so high that i think maybe we just haven't noticed that this effect was never triggering um but it is very very narrow now there certainly are considerations uh when an opponent is trying to uh race with you they have to be aware that like they attack with their three three boba can free kill it but if they're racing with you the maybe like you were supposed to attack their base anyway so like even in those situations sometimes it would have been better for you to not use capitalize on the ability so th because of the fact that there are other options now not only is there just a very clean option in toro calican for these decks where he's also a three five with another upside ability so they both are three fives with upsides but Toros might be more relevant sometimes. So he he could be a consideration there. Like DJ is could be a consideration there. And also just going more space, for instance. I think you could like lurking ties, seventh fleet defenders, just like playing more threes in space, um, could also be an option here. Like, do we need to play these three fives on the ground? Our worst matchup with these Boba decks tend to be things like Kira and these three power units on the ground are actually a big reason that Kira becomes so dangerous because she flips and free kills them and leaves behind a seven power unit. And now 
you are very much tasked to spend your whole turn basically like ambushing her with something and using up your whole turn because you can't have her sit around with seven health and one shot literally anything you play or potentially board wipe you with a barrage or potentially get shielded up by something like a vigilance so uh those three power units just to talk about another one with Bodhi, are a pretty big liability in that matchup so um i could see boba getting trimmed just because of that um but in general even if you if you still wanted these three fives they, they are still very good in a lot of matchups so you know you can't just change your whole deck because of one matchup but if you're going to keep these three fives like is toro just better at this point than boba like certainly if you have you're playing enough other bounty hunters like forlom or zuckus or um bosk uh there's like greedo is incidental bounty hunter now him triggering toro is not fantastic but uh you see that there are a lot so is toro getting a trigger maybe easier than boba fett potentially like maybe we don't need to be playing this legendary so much all right number three is crate dragon um yeah i i think this card is is pretty clearly overplayed actually uh, i don't think this really needs to be a three of like basically ever um it's good it's okay like i think i think the thing about crate dragon is it's not good unless you've already dealt a lot of damage to your opponent right like slamming a nine drop that doesn't do anything except potentially damage to your opponent's base uh is really only good when that damage to the opponent's base matters right so him being your top end of a very slow controlling deck uh i don't i don't think that really works for him um from personal experience beating a lot a lot of crate dragons by playing avenger and just taking nine to the base and the game basically ends after that because their nine drop is dead your nine drops alive uh and that nine damage didn't matter um now when the nine damage matters obviously that's when crate wins like if you were able to pressure your opponent a lot then slamming a crate is really good and i think crate if you're playing with like timely intervention to get him ambush so so he can come in and slam also pretty good there just aren't very many green red uh villain decks floating around right now although that's actually probably where i like it the most because you can get a lot of chip damage along the way in those decks generally whether you're playing them with like bosk uh where he does like like early aggressive stuff because that's what boss does like i'm not even talking like a big boss ramp deck i'm just talking like an aggressive boss deck that also plays like super laser tech in the ramp bounty because you do that in in bosk and then you're playing ruthless raiders and you're getting a ton of damage that way in that mid game and then yeah like even if you get controlled out uh if you're at that threshold you slam that crate or if you have timely intervention in your deck which boss decks typically do as well then pretty good you look at like pal red uh vader green now i think those decks are probably too slow in this meta in general but they would also be decks where i'd be like okay these decks can actually do get some chip damage because primarily like ruthless raider vader has his pings um i'm not saying you shouldn't play this deck at all in like other decks right i, th I think it's certainly acceptable to play this in like a young han deck it also is an eight drop in that deck i just don't think you should rely on it so much to be like this game ender into a lot of decks i think con the idea that this is like a trump card into control decks is not really true uh he doesn't matter unless you've pushed damage a lot so if the control deck was preventing that from happening your crate dragon is not going to save you right it still dies to like power the dark side and fell the dragon very cleanly and for very little damage it's a really bad trade if fell the dragon knocks this down right it's in the name anyway right you've spent nine resources and they spent four and all you get is four damage out of that transaction it's really really bad for you unless of course that four damage matters but again i've said it like seven times it only matters if you've pushed damage throughout the game all right number two is the sabling fang fighter uh i'll give you my pitch here i think basically any deck playing this card would be better off just playing confiscate in that spot um right now i don't 
I think the upgrades that matter are it's like dark saber. It's like almost entirely dark saber. Maybe Boba's armor if that makes an uptick. But for the most part, you just need to be able to interact with that dark saber the turn it comes down. It's too late if you're playing this in the turn after. Uh you would have already taken seven damage and now you're spending three of your five resources on the following turn to kill the dark saber and then the sabine is still in play right so it's not like that did very much the body on this unit is it doesn't matter right like this is a responsive card this is a removal this is being played by decks playing being the control deck in a situation and i think the resource efficiency of confiscate is going to vastly outweigh the uh like card advantage this theoretically gives you right now if people are slamming traitorous all over the place sure like i think disabling fang fighter is a pretty big blowout into a traitorous but i already put traitors on this list so now no one's going to be playing traitorous after today so disabling fang fighter also a little bit worse but yeah i uh for the most part i just think confiscate is cleaner um upgrade hate in general it's dark saber that's like basically it i don't think you need to focus so much on upgrade hate unless you are a deck that folds to dark saber or really needs that clean answer to it in that case that's what confiscate is that's what like if you're playing mono red sure you get like aggression that's a good card to just have in your deck and incidentally have upgrade hate for but uh i don't think disabling fang fighter eating up sideboard slots is uh is gonna do too much for a lot of decks uh so maybe try confiscate and see how you like it and you know maybe you won't and maybe i'm completely wrong but so far that's where i think uh there's more success to be had all right number one i think everyone here who's watched my channel already knew this card was going to be here from the start it is in fact rivals fall it is not a card that i think is bad it is well let me change that it is not a card that i think is unplayable i think there's some decks that can play this card, but for the most part, I think most decks shouldn't, uh, and most decks would be better off just finding something else. Uh, this, I've said a lot of things about this card in general, so I'll try to be succinct. Um, this is basically bad Vanquish, unless you're targeting a leader, right? So that that's not to be disputed, right? Vanquish costs five. This hits the exact same units Vanquish does, except also leaders. Um, but leaders in, are free, right? Like, that's kind of the issue with spending six resources. They spent zero on their leader. So most of the time, you need to find better ways to deal with leaders. And most decks that would be playing Rivals Fall have better ways to deal with leaders. Like, the number one control deck right now, the like one that gets played the most, is Kira. And she is built in leader removal. Uh, just, like, into her ability. Also, like, villain control decks, they have power of the dark side. They have overwhelming barrage. Uh, those are good. They have units. They have things like Vader to come down and like maybe kill a leader and leave behind another unit. So why are we playing Rivals Fall? And the most common thing I hear and like why Rivals Fall from all kinds of sources is like what what is a control deck, whether it's Kira or like a, a young Han do against boba's armor um some decks i think m if that becomes incredibly popular might need rivals fall um some decks i don't think need rivals fall kira for instance i don't think needs rivals fall i think there's so many like game situations that you can manage through a boba's armor without this card and what i want to like stress here is does Rivals Fall fix this problem or does Rivals Fall just make you lose two turns later a game anyway? Because I think a lot of the, like what you might think like, okay, you played this game where you were X deck playing against like a Boba deck that played a Boba's armor. And then you had no out in your hand and they killed you. And you were like, if I had Rivals Fall, I wouldn't have died. Uh, but I think maybe you would have died anyway if you had Rivals Fall. And that's something you need to think about. Um, are you fixing a problem or is it just a band-aid that then you pay your dues a couple turns later? Because if you're spending six resources the turn after a Boba's armor, it's typically going to be the turn after. So they've probably already hit you. 
and gotten ahead and you spend your whole turn answering that boba and then like a fire spray comes down right and you can't answer that fire spray you just spent your whole turn answering the previous turn's problem and you lose steam and you lose momentum and you die anyway a couple turns later because you took six and you took five and then you took something else and you just don't win so let's instead of focusing on like how do we not lose to this exact scenario we find ways to mitigate that scenario from happening as much as possible and then also know that there are situations where like we didn't draw right and they drew right and we don't beat them because like they had the right sequences and they were able to protect that boba and they got the armor on and we didn't have like barrage or power of the dark side or a good ambush the turn before with whatever we were doing or like if we were if we're playing with like a Han deck, for instance, we weren't able to get three damage on the Boba first so that our Luke couldn't kill it the next turn for, for with its minus six, minus six, like, and we lose. And we don't say we lost because we didn't have rivals fall. We say we lost because we couldn't sequence the game correctly or maybe we didn't draw the right cards because in a lot of situations, you're going to have that rivals fall and you're going to be like, great. I got the Boba with the Boba's armor and then you're still going to lose because this didn't really catch you up. It just delayed the inevitable. And that is what I want to stress here is that I think the better solutions to these problems and like it really is Boba's armor. Like I don't know what other scenarios like it's obviously way too slow for like Dark Sabered Sabines. I think by the time we're talking about like big leaders like Vader's and Palps, at that point, you just want Super Laser Blast. Like you'd prefer more copies of Super Laser Blast at that turn. Not to mention that's a card that's pretty good into Bobas who are like spending more time up, like trying to like fight for the board to protect a Boba with Boba's armor. Uh, Super Laser Blast, pretty good, right? That, that, that can like reset the game and then like go into an Avenger turn. So do we really need Rivals Fall? Uh, is a question that so far my conclusion has been no. I don't think most decks need it. I think certainly it can be an option, like a one of, uh, like basically saying like I'm gonna hedge a little bit. Like mostly this is bad vanquish in my deck, which sometimes is gonna be good enough, right? Like it can still kill an Avenger or a Crate Dragon or a Luke or a Han unit, right? So. Yeah, it's not as good as Fell the Dragon in any of those situations and in most situations, but yeah, I've got this like backup out where like if things line up, I'll be able to like snag a leader with this uh, and and it'll be it'll be good or good enough, right? So I'm not telling you no deck deserves to play this ever. Uh, I'm just saying it probably needs to be played quite a bit less and... Uh, there are decks that I don't think need to be playing this at all. And yeah, I hope this is the last pitch I have to make on Rivals Fall. I've talked about this card a lot. And I do get asked about it a decent amount. Not like disrespectfully or anything. It's just, it is a conversation that comes up a decent amount. Um, I'm on Discords and I, pay, I've had, like, I have a Patreon. Like people message me and Rivals Fall has been a topic of conversation. So uh, this is kind of like, the best way I was able to like verbalize my opinion on this card. Uh, and that opinion can change, right? Like th it's all like situation dependent. And if other things come up where like rivals fall is the only way to deal with them, then certainly having this as a tool is very useful, but overall, I think a little overplayed right now. All right, that's it. I hope this was fun. Hope this, Got you thinking a little bit about these cards, right? A lot of these are like staples. They're like cards that we've been playing for even some of them from like set one a ton and like certainly from the beginning of set two. And a lot of these cards are very good too. So it's not that these are bad cards. It's just, can we start, can we reset sometimes? Like it's not a bad idea sometimes just like take a deck, be like, okay, this has been a good deck. Let's remove all the cards and rebuild it now knowing what we know about the metagame now. Like, like, let's not do this in pieces. Let's reset completely. Like, if I was building a deck right now, would it look different? Like, as opposed to me editing a deck where I'm, like, skipping through 40 of the cards because I'm like, the automatic, automatic, auto-include, auto-include, auto-include. Oh, this, maybe I'll trim one here. As opposed to, like, tell yourself none of these cards are auto-include. Not even that legendary Boba unit is an auto-include anymore. And can this deck be made better 
uh, with fresh eyes. All right, that's it. Again, please like the video if you enjoy this. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, check out the Patreon. And until next time, which will probably be the start of preview season on this channel, I'll see you then.